Um, uh, Francois, yeah. it Maybe is I can begin. It okay. is eleven a.m. exactly on my side. So shall we begin? Let's go. Okay, uh, thank you. <clears throat> hi, everybody. I am Francois Xavier Bofi, head of IT department of Université Claude Bernard, Lyon Academic Library, and information coordinator of the IFLA IT section. I'm pleased to welcome you in the third coffee talk in our series about IT academics and libraries. Today's webinar is entitled Library Research Data Management Services. Where are we now? Data management issues are, have progressively grown in academics. Many academic libraries are involved in supporting researchers about this or plan to do it soon. In addition, when a research support department is designed, research data management is one of top priorities of this service. However, have a pitfalls to avoid with some insight upon the development of library research data management services are there good practices to return and good trends to follow? To reply to this question, uh, let me introduce you. Uh, yes, yeah, so first, I uh, have just a few words about uh, how uh, the webinar will, uh, uh, will be uh, before. Uh, yes, uh, some guidelines that you can see on the, on the, on the screen. Uh, please uh, mute your, your mic if uh, it's on and uh, you can comment uh, or ask question through chat or uh, Q&A box. Uh, this webinar is recorded as you can see also. So first uh, we'll uh, hear uh, Edmund, Dr. Edmund Balnevs uh, as the CEO and founder of Percentient uh, Systems. He brings to the business over two decades of industry experience in information systems with a skill set covering a broad range of architectures and development envi environments. Sorry. Uh, Dr. Banavas uh, is actively engaged in research and has a strong publication record in the area of web and library services. Uh, as a member of ALIR, Australian Library Information Association, uh, I3E, and standing committee member of the IT section of IFLA. He has a panoramic view on many IT and library topics, including uh, RDM services. We will then uh, hear uh, the talk about, uh, from uh, Dr. Lynn Tatum Kleinveld. Uh, born in Cape Town, South Africa, she obtained a PhD in philosophy, science, cognition, and semiotics in uh, 2080 uh, from the University of Bologna in, in, in Italy. She's currently a lecturer in the Faculty of Business and Management Services, uh, Science, sorry, at the Cape uh, Peninsula University of Technology in Cape Town, South Africa. Dr. Klein Welt is standing committee member of the IT section of IFLA and the acting chair of the IO Education Libraries Interest Group in the Library and Information Association of South Africa. So uh, let hear a first talk uh, from uh, Dr. Edmund Balnevs. Please, Edmund, you can. Hello, everyone. I'll just share my screen. Hi. Uh, uh, as Francois Xavier said, I'm a technologist at heart, and particularly with a focus on open source systems. So you'll see a little bit of a thrust of that in the presentation I'm giving today, uh, but also with a focus on research data management services. I work with a, a number of different uh, types of libraries servicing research areas, so university, um, independent research institutes, uh, and other um, independent special libraries that have a research need. And I thought I'd uh, dwell a little bit on the, the context where research data management applies. We do indeed live in a, a very rich ecosystem of research data services these days. Um, you have a range of tools available, uh, research data management systems like Research Master, a commercial product, which allow you to 
uh, assemble um, the information about research in your institution uh, towards funding grants and to um, prepare proposals about research to bodies that may be funding that uh, very actively is within the universities in Australia uh, when the annual uh, uh, funding uh, and research grant processes apply. You have uh, publication repositories and current research information systems like DSpace CRIS. You have data management systems like Figshare, Mendeley, Data, Wikidata, Dataverse, PIMCOR. I'll talk a little bit about those. And you have national data services that, that might aggregate uh, or provide the systems that you may lack in your institution uh, where you don't have access to those services yourself. And an example in Australia is the ARDC, the Australian Research Data Commons, previously known as ANDS. Uh, they, for instance, may provide uh, DOI minting services. Uh, you have external discovery systems that would hook into your research areas to, to support the research process. Uh, data warehouses outside that, uh, external identity services like ORCID, DOI handle, and local identity information systems like SAML for single sign on to your systems. So quite a rich, a complex uh, ecosystem supporting uh, research uh, activities. And to put it in a context, you have that uh, flow of research, which starts with a research question, uh, where you may then start undertaking research and collecting data. Uh, you may then uh, arguably say that uh, you prepare a data management plan, but probably you should have that done at an earlier stage in assembling the research, but realistically data management plans happen quite late in the piece. Then you have a process of publishing and archiving, uh, which feeds into discovery systems. So that's where your research uh, goes into the, the wider sphere of other researchers and, and the process by which you, you share and make available your research and the way in which that then feeds into discovery systems, which then itself feeds into that new cycle of, of research questions and, and starting your research. I thought it uh, useful to put it in that context of that research cycle because different parts of those systems that I mentioned there belong to different elements of that uh, research data services ecosystem. Uh, for instance, the DOI uh, provides a, a key integration tool uh, for publications at the, the publishing and archiving end, for, which feeds into the discovery which is uh, providing a, uh, a unique identifier for publications resulting from the research, uh, which then can be cited and reused in other environments. Um, handles which provide a, a, a static consistent reference to publications that have been published. All of those fit within that um, uh, publishing and archiving stage, including um, uh, those processes like uh, DSpace CRIS. So I'll mention a few of those later, particularly um, the, the systems that support the outcomes of research that feed into the research data services. And all of this uh, is framed around open data services. I mentioned that because uh, the, the, the risk of research is that it stays in a silo. And this has been a particularly large um, problematic for uh, uh, developing countries for uh, developing continents for Africa, for uh, South America, where uh, there might be very good research undertaken, uh, but it's not very widely shared and it doesn't have the presence and visibility that's, that can make it more significant in the, in the wider uh, publishing context of research that happens. So the data standards that you uh, adhere to within the institution can be quite significant to the visibility uh, of the research that your institution is undertaking. And so I mentioned open data standards, which IFLA is very involved in. Uh, so the IFLA IT section, for instance, that I'm on the standing committee for IT, as is uh, Francois Xavier and Lynn, uh, is very involved in, in defining standards for linked data, that is uh, uh, sharing of information systematically on the web, linking uh, related entities, uh, the semantic web associated with that. 
um, and also the traditional uh, cataloging standards uh, like MARC, authorities, management, classification, uh, and national research ontologies as well. Uh, so for instance, within Australia, we have a field of research subject classification system that defines consistently across all research institutions within uh, the country, a sets of uh, research uh, tags that are then used um, very significantly within the funding bodies to apportion funding according to pr national priorities for research. So those field of research classification processes are quite critical to the visibility of research within the, the, uh, the country. And the institutions that are conscious of that and manage that uh, carefully and deliberately um, are the ones often that will succeed more effectively uh, in, in gaining additional research funding. So I mentioned that even though it may sound ancillary to um, the research data services process, it's actually quite significant, uh, quite significant for discovery of research and quite significant for visibility uh, within the institution and within the national context where funding might apply. And then you have data standards uh, for the research data itself that are quite significant as well. One often forgotten but quite significant is uh, data standards around licensing. Uh, the most common being, of course, Creative Commons. Uh, then you have metadata standards for uh, archiving, so METS uh, particularly. Metadata for sharing and education like SCORM and EDUX. And uh, you have case report forms where research data is collected, assembled and pulled together uh, when research is submitted. So I mentioned all of these in the context of open source because open source is quite significant as a a platform for delivery of research data systems. Uh, open source uh, had its uh, uh, early uh, origins within the university context with Unix uh, and later with the evolution of uh, Linux, which borrowed a lot of the tool set that evolved for Unix. Uh, and the most widely, li widely used library management system in the world, Koha, uh, is an open source system with a very large community of developers contributed to by libraries and organizations all around the world. So open source, it gives deployment flexibility. You can roll your own, you can host it on-prem, or you can host it in a cloud managed by yourself, or you can gain a hosting provider to do that work for you. Uh, it has elements of reduced costs, but my argument is the most significant element is that it's open in data as well as source. That is open source systems tend to give you agency and ownership of the research data that you're producing. Um, and I've seen this many times where data goes into commercial systems and there's a penalty cost that's quite high to then get your own data back out of those systems when you move and evolve into other environments. So I'll talk a little bit about um, one of the uh, publishing environments for research data. And that's the DSpace CRIS system, CRIS standing for Current Research Information Systems. Uh, so this is a digital repository that links researchers to publications, funding, uh, departments, and data sets. Uh, and those data sets are then uh, stored within, for instance, um, uh, an object store environment like Amazon S3. Fairly significant because uh, you can sometimes find research data sets are very large. Um, certainly within the University of New England that I provide support for, uh, their data sets can often be one terabyte or more in size. Uh, and that can be from detailed research research that's, that's uh, supported by large groups, multi-institutional uh, work and so on. Uh, so you need uh, an extensible environment for storage of those research data sets and uh, Amazon provides a, a, an interesting option for that because uh, it's, 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 if you like, infinitely extensible for the storing of those data sets. Uh, but there's no lock-in in that and you can store within other object stores as well. Microsoft Azure has an object store and there are many, many other emerging uh, types of cloud-based storage uh, that are available there. So the importance of that uh, research uh, 
orientation to the digital archive is that it brings all of the uh, institutional information together about researchers, so the researchers and their publications, uh, and the uh, the ladders you can produce of that of who's who's got the most publications at a given time. It can be quite interesting and competitive. Uh, you have the funding funding sources, uh, uh, departments uh, where pub supporting publication, schools, and so on, and the data sets themselves. Uh, the this provides a platform to feed into the, the research services and the uh, analytical systems that are then used, for instance, to bid for additional funding uh, in Australia. That might be the year arounds that, are, that come around uh, every couple of years to, to bid for additional funding and resources. And if you have them in a, a platform like this where it links the publications uh, through to the researchers and uh, the departments, undertaking the research and behind that a consistent um, subject metadata ontology so that your research can be easily analyzed compare and compared to others in that same area you then have an effective platform to work with uh, the other points of integration within um, the UNE CRIS environment are the single sign-on so I mentioned SAML and other integrations. So they are the process by which a researcher can access this system transparently from all of their other sign-on in the institution. So it's not a foreign external service, even though it's cloud hosted, um, they sign on as they sign on everywhere with their institutional uh, credentials. Pretty standard um, approach these days, but a mixed um, uh, implementation across different environments that I see. So that's one example of open source. Open source meaning that you can deploy that yourself, you can bring in experts who might deploy it for you, um, and you'll see within the uh, research data services environment, there's a wide range of open source available for you to pick from. Um, DSpace Chris, I just mentioned, an institutional repository, and there are a range of others like ePrints that provide similar services, also open source. Archive Matica, uh, which is a systematic method for preparing items for submission into the archive. Uh, Kimcore, which provides uh, data management systems and data management plans. I mentioned the evolution of data management plans and I suspect Lynn will talk a little bit about that. It's, it's often a, a much neglected element of managing data. Uh, because there's not a lot of consistency in the development of data management plans within an institution or between institutions in a national context. Uh, and it's quite a challenging area uh, and a pretty much an evolving area. There's not much in open source in that area, but PIMCOR within their data management systems does offer uh, uh, an open source framework for, for building um, data management plans. You also have in the publishing context, open journal systems uh, for, for the um, uh, the ownership of the research output within the institution involved. Um, it, it's one of the, uh, I guess, tragedies of research ownership that so little of what is produced by research institutions is ultimately owned by the research institutions because the copyright is uh, endowed into the um, publishing environments that they're passed on through. And uh, open access uh, as an approach to publishing is, is, is something of a challenge to that um, and good to see. You have Zotero, which is a reference management system. Um, often within research areas, uh, there's, there's a large knowledge base built up within that research area that lives within the citational management systems that that research um, data area works with. And it's it's an interesting element of research data services to, to be conscious of that because um, as uh, was mentioned to me when I was doing my uh, doctoral research, a good bibliography is, is a really good starting point to any research. Uh, you have Dataverse and Figshare, uh, two very widely implemented uh, data set um, and uh, uh, research data management tools uh, that encompassing them uh, uh, a very comprehensive suite 
of tools and integrations for managing research data. So open source has a lot to contribute to the research uh, data environment. And just a, a caution, um, there is a difference between free and open source. And I guess to contrast that, I mentioned Wikidata as a platform for research data management, uh, compared to, for instance, Google. Uh, Google provides a lot of free, or at least initially free, data services that can be very attractive because they're, they're expansible, they're accessible very widely, um, they're very functional. Um, and Wikidata also provides some platforms for, for submission of research, particularly they're interested in uh, national and public research, uh, not so much research, but uh, national public data output and the ways in which that can be integrated, open government and that sort of thing. And free is not necessarily open to contrast those two. Wikidata has worked a lot with IFLA uh, and indeed, I guess, as a, a collaborative uh, uh, organization, uh, its its whole ethos and philosophy is very similar to that of, of libraries and library institutions. So who owns your data could be quite significant in that point of free, not necessarily open. And an interesting example of that, uh, that certainly I and probably a lot of you have experienced was the, the, the fairly abrupt transition of uh, Google Maps from a free service to a fee service. Um, and that can be a pretty short, sharp shock uh, in managing your systems. So who owns the content in many ways owns the client. Free is not necessarily open. Um, and that's very apparent, apparent within the social media context uh, with Facebook and the misuse of data with Facebook. And that uh, obvious truth that monopolies don't necessarily act in the long-term interests of their clients, um, they act in the long-term interests of their investors. So getting back to the University of New England um, and to, to talk a little bit more about the ways in which it provides an example for uh, an open source environment for delivery of uh, research data services and the integration that applies. So central to that, environment, there's a, a DSpace CRIS uh, publication repository. Uh, that uh, research CRIS repository is enhanced by ingestion through sources like Scopus, Web of Science and ORCID. Um, and it has data sets published through that um, towards the end of the, the research uh, phase uh, through Archivematica. So Archivematica provides for larger data sets, a, a consistent way of analyzing, uh, describing, and compiling the, um, the data against uh, descriptive standards like METS before submission into the digital archive for long-term retention. That then feeds through to those object stores. So object stores uh, are becoming very significant in that whole world of big data. And data sets are very representative of big data. Uh, and assembling that within uh, an object store provides a framework where you can uh, at least manage that and reuse that content in other ways. Uh, and then you have obviously the identity systems, ORCID for your researchers and uh, DOI for your publication identity systems. And I know certainly within Australia, a number of institutions are making ORCID mandatory for all of their researchers. So you can see in that context, interestingly, uh, the larger part of the components of those services are uh, open source systems implemented in a mix of cloud-based implementation uh, hosted uh, and managed for them or managed by themselves, uh, including the, uh, the Samuel Shibboleth environment that they're signing in on, uh, and some commercial services, particularly those large uh, research um, uh, discovery systems like Scopus and Web of Science. So 
So if you're looking at that whole world of um, working with research data services, uh, I guess you might ask the question, where next? Well, it's all about integration. Uh, all of my work working with open source is open source integration. Obviously, as a, a, a platform open source, you're not charging for software. And indeed, the, the interesting element of the work is that integration across the platforms and open source very often provides all of the hooks to do that integration uh, with other services, the integration with your research uh, management systems, integration with your HR, integration with your uh, single sign-on services, integration with other data set services uh, underlying the environment that you're working in. And bearing in mind that research data can often be in itself big data, there's that whole world emerging of artificial intelligence. And uh, IFLA has been uh, quite active in that in the IT section in, in probing the whole area of AI and robotics and the ways in which they, they can apply to uh, research and library services. And this is a quite an exciting area to, to uh, discover and play with. And uh, the IFLA IT T section is participating in a, a, a conference in November on AI and robotics, which uh, if you're interested in, it would be well worth joining as well. Online conference, of course, in these strange COVID days. So that's just about all of my time used up. A, a very quick look at all of the environment and the ecosystem that applies to research data services. I hope that's been helpful and, uh, and useful to you all. There are plenty of other resources, as I'm sure you've discovered on the web. I've mentioned a few on the page there, and it's been a delight to be here and uh, presenting on this topic. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Edmund. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, for now, we don't have a specific questions about uh, the presentation but uh, you still have time to do it. And uh, uh, we can uh, go on with the, uh, the talk from Lynn, uh, which I already presented you. <laughs> Please, Lynn, thank you. Thank you, um, Francois. Thank you, Edmund. I'm just going to share my screen quickly. And, okay, um, so good day everybody um, and the welcome once again to our um, webinar. Um, I will be sharing um, some reflections on um, library research data management services. Um, and I will be briefly providing an overview on um, research data management. Um, services, the benefits of um, research data management, some challenges, what are the skills and compet competencies needed, um, and also uh, touching briefly on where, where we are currently now with library research data management services and where we should be heading with these services. For a long time, we have constantly been experiencing information overload. But now we live in a world of data overload. However, we cannot conduct research without the data. So um, we've seen that there is um, an explosion of data repositories and um, with all the research that is being uh, conducted, there is an abundance of data sets and data, and um, this is what researchers um, need in order to create new science and knowledge. But McKenna argues that data overload has got nothing to do with human limitations, but rather 
it's got to do with design failure. We see that the conversation has been going on for quite some time with regards to um, ethical data sharing, managing data, and the reuse among scholars, which have started um, uh, some time ago. And we can see that um, uh, publications are tracing back to the 1978s, as Scopus reveals. Thus, the practice of analyzing secondary data by government policymakers, economic planners, faculty, and researchers was possible due to many of these stakeholders, including private research organizations and foundations, investing heavily in collecting data, contributing to the proliferation of machine-readable data. As we know, over time, funders and, and publishers have been pushing authors and researchers to upload data sets into a repository as part of manuscript submissions. In response to these requirements and to support the research pillar of higher education institutions, academic libraries started supporting this trend by providing research data management services. This also involved contributing to the implementation of research data management policies and guidelines, providing services such as um, data management plan templates and providing um, the data repositories for data sets to be stored. Therefore, it's worth noting what research data management entails. And it can be described as a research component specifically dealing with proper organization and preservation of research data for the purpose of current and future access and use. And overall, it contributes to practicing good science Researchers are therefore encouraged to follow the fair principles when depositing data, and this entails that the data must be findable, meaning ensuring it can be found by humans and machines. It needs to be accessible so that um, uh, once someone has found your data, they need to know how they can actually access um, or, or get access to it. And this could include going through an authorization or authentication process. Um, doesn't have to be open. It also needs to be interoperable, ensuring that your data can be integrated with other data and that they can be utilized by applications or workflows for analysis, storage and processing. And then finally, it needs to be reusable, ensuring that the data and the related metadata are well described and indicate how they can be reused with appropriate licensing. Some benefits of research data management um, is or are um, that data can be verified um, it contributes to the practice of good science and um, for secondary data analysis that there are new data interpretation beyond um, what the data was initial, initially intended for, that these can be um, uh, um, conducted um, towards um, decision making um, in organizations, um, etc. And also what is important is the impact that the data um, uh, presents, that it's discoverable, understandable, and also reusable. 
and overall to save time and money, especially when we look at the increase in student numbers and the um, more and more um, undergraduate programs are incorporating um, research components and more and more students are therefore needing to conduct research projects and considering the time constraints um, that that um, are available this is um, an area where students can benefit from accessing data sets however there are also some um, challenges with research data management. And it is claimed that data overload is experienced when irrelevant data is retrieved, data is not presented appropriately to the user, and there isn't enough data. Previous research revealed that researchers also have mixed feelings about research data management especially when data has commercial value. Research data management policies being the driving force to making research data more accessible has found to be not always the case. And uh, uh, there was a, a study conducted that um, explained um, the specific mechanisms for data sharing are often unspecified and the implementation of such policies are largely untested. Very few journals have an explicit statement regarding how their data sharing policies are enforced and thus it is unclear what options are available to investigators who encounter authors who are unwilling to share their data. Another great concern is the different sizes of data that is generated, which can range from terabytes to petabytes and eventually exabytes, will affect storage capacity, which raises questions as to um, uh, who will be covering the cost for long-term preservation of big data. And to keep up with the trends, researchers and librarians need to acquire um, research data management skills. So some of these research data management skills um, that are required include um, ICT, being ICT-centric, and this is, um, has been revealed in um, a study where job um, advertisements um, and, and the requirements for research data management services um, revealed that um, candidates need to be ICT centric. Um, other research data management skills include curation standards and practices, models that guide data curation, long and short-term data curation activities, and selection of data for preservation and data citation. However, uh, Maureen argues that you can be data literate and understand the principles of research data management without ever running the analysis, building visualizations, or standing up a server. She further elaborates that one should draw on what we already know and skill sets such as preservation, organization, application, appraisal, and access, which librarians possess that will support researchers. Library associations also play a key role in developing the profession and many training workshops and webinars are conducted to support, in support of the trends. Um, for example, the very first research data management training workshop with South African librarians, uh, which was a joint initiative with the Library and Information Association of South Africa and the UK's Digital Curation Centre took place in 2014. 
Um, another uh, study uh, that was recently conducted at the medical library um, in Africa revealed that some librarians showed competency in migrating data to newer file formats, creating preservation metadata, transferring digital objects to repositories and collecting data from creators. So where are we now with research data management services? And um, Edmund uh, presented quite a, a number of them. And uh, this slide is also just a selection of um, data, data management services ranging from research data management policy and guide guidelines that are made available um, templates for online data management, um, uh, plans that um, are required by so many researchers um, uh, when they are applying for funding, um, and also postgraduate students when they are um, applying for ethical clearance, more and more data management plans are, are required. And um, there are a range of data repositories. I'm only highlighting a, a few on the slide. Um, but it is also worth noting that research data management services, depending on the higher education institution, may also be provided by central research offices um, as recent research findings mm -hmm. reveal. These may pose challenges with regards to roles in supporting research data management if units work in silos, um, as it would become challenging to identify gaps. Therefore, the role clarification, communication, and collaboration remain key when marketing research data management services. So I just uh, selected a Dataverse, which um, Edmund also um, um, highlighted in his uh, presentation, but just to uh, provide an overview of um, where organizations um, across the world have um, uh, are, or are using Dataverse. And then um, this slide is just uh, um, illustrating a selection of the 74 higher education institutions globally that are using the Figshare data repository. So I uh, thought, um, let me explore a little bit in terms of um, the uptake and the use of Figshi in particular among um, li academic libraries. And so I um, selected one, one province in South Africa and explored the number of the total number of data sets that are currently um, uh, existing within the Figshi um, data repositories. And this uh, represents uh, the total figures as um, at the 15th of July 2021. So um, as recent as last week, um, taking into consideration that um, the launch of FIGSHI um, took place in um, uh, the towards the end of 20, 2017. And one thing that I wanted to point out, um, the university with the least number of data sets, this university library actually uh, provides three data repositories for the university community. So it is open to researchers to decide where they would like to um, deposit the data set in, not necessarily that they need to um, uh, deposit it in the, the FIG-SHARE uh, data, data repository. 
But um, on further reflection, um, the, the total or the slow growth speaks to some of the earlier challenges that I've mentioned, but it also um, relates to previous findings um, in a study that was conducted in 2011 regarding the reasons why researchers do not share data electronically. And the main reasons being that um, there is just insufficient time and lack of funding. Um, we also find a situation where researchers today still feel comfortable with sticking to storing data on desktop computers, laptops, and even external hard drives or flash drives, even though there are risks of losing data should these local storage devices crash. Due to the nature of research data, it is perhaps a common practice to approach an author or researcher directly to request the research data to be shared the same way full text works are requested via social networking sites such as ResearchGate, Academia or Mendeley. However, the extent to which researchers are willing to share their research data is perhaps an area that need to be further explored. Um, a study where data was requested from 10 researchers who had published articles in PLOS journals, which are, or, or rather, which have specific data sharing policies, resulted in only one author sharing an original data set. So this uh, leaves, leaves so many questions in our minds with regards to um, the, the, data, the data sets that are currently not being, being shared. Nevertheless, where should we be heading with research data management services, considering um, what, what, what the challenges are, um, but also considering all the services that are currently um, in place. And if we consider the complexities of data and the management of it, academic libraries are cons constantly transforming and exploring new ways of remaining relevant and providing state-of-the-art services to the university community. Academic libraries also play a key role in supporting researchers with research data management, which include assisting with metadata and quality checks before data is published in an institution's data repository. The current research library research services provided do show promise and speaks to advocating for open science. Um, I have also just um, recommended that perhaps it is time for us to keep on promoting research data management. And also, it is important in order to create a better research environment that we constantly be communicating and collaborating with all stakeholders. We need to keep on learning, as Maureen puts it, a little extra training never hurts. And it is also worth offering faculty guest lectures. Perhaps it's time to um, approach faculty so that research data management can be embedded in the research methodology subjects um, through an advanced information literacy program. 
But what remains key is that data needs to be linked. And in shifting the attention to postgraduate students also means increasing academic librarian capacity. So in conclusion, over and above supporting the university community with research data management, the question in my mind remains, to what extent is data currently being reused to create new science and knowledge at our um, universities? And this remains open for further research and debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Lynn. Uh, we can go on with the questions. Uh, the first one is uh, for you. Uh, you said one of the challenges of RDM is about cost and space. We, who will pay for long-term preservation of data? May you elaborate on this? Are there costs involved in, uh, for, for hosting our this space? Uh, uh, or maybe uh, can we use open source platforms? So it's from uh, Maropini Rama Bina. Thank you. Um, yes, I mentioned that um, it, is, it is something to consider. Um, of course, there are many open source platforms, but um, institutions are also subscribing to um, uh, data management uh, repositories. And um, the, the question remains, um, in the long term, is it possible, considering budget constraints, there's always budget cuts, whether these are sustainable? So I hope that answers, answers the question. And of course, um, it's open for further discussion in this session. Um, I, I certainly do not have all the answers, but it is um, a question that uh, constantly is in the back of my mind in terms of the long-term preservation of, of data sets um, and whether um, academic libraries who opt for the subscribed options are um, able to, um, to maintain those subscriptions. So that is basically what, what I've meant by the um, re research data management challenges, one of them, and the concern. I hope that answers um, the question. I hope so. Um, further question can be asked, of course. Uh, another one is uh, from Nina Lewin. Uh, <clears throat> I'm wondering how to measure data reuse, also reluctance, uh, to do secondary data in degrees. In this uh, perception problem, uh, is this, sorry, uh, perception problem or a real one? Um, sorry, is that a, a question for me? Yeah, um, I may, it may be for both of you. Uh, okay. would like to reply. Maybe Edmond? Yeah. Um, so can just recap that question again. It's an interesting one. Yes. Uh, yes. It, um, it, perhaps I can start. I, I was just um, uh, thinking when I was um, uh, um, extracting some some data from from Fixi, um, and to try and answer the question: How would one uh, measure the 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 actual data reuse? That I think relates to um, um, the number of um, times the data is actually cited, um, because the lit literature speaks about um, data be being cited in the the publications. Okay. Um, and also when data is being reused, um, there should be acknowledgement of that data. So, so it's a matter of checking 
data sets that are currently available in the repositories, um, whether they have been cited? I think also the, uh, the evolution of cloud services and, and cloud object stores provides an environment where uh, very large data sets can feasibly be shared and made available. And the, uh, the, the sharing of these large data sets offers opportunities that are not really fully realized at the moment. But uh, the, the, the interesting aspects of AI over these large data sets are the ways in which research will evolve as we go along. That is, um, the, the process of AI within big data is a process of unanticipated discovery. It's, it's pattern matching uh, for patterns that may not even have been realized before. And research data is a, is a component of big data and fits very well if done right in that uh, big data analytics model for AI. So the, the process of, of preservation of the uh, research data that you have uh, can be significant in ways that are not yet anticipated. So those um, ontologies about what data is about um, and of, of uh, discovery and sharing of data in consistent ways that you plan for now may have uh, unanticipated long-term benefits to the institution. So getting back to that first question even, the, there's looking at your data solely as a cost is underestimating the, the long-term value of data as an asset. Uh, and that's, I guess, the thing that research uh, data services need to uh, put their mind to, which is, is being conscious of of those data uh, stores, not just as silos, but as, as long-term assets um, that may not have immediately an opportunity to realize at this point, but which, which may have very long-term value to the institution and to the researchers involved. Okay, uh, we have another question um, from Rosina. Uh, it looks like data sharing is a general problem. I agree with you. It needs a further exploration or maybe open a conversation on it. I think universities need to come up with some initiatives or incentives for data sharing as a motivating factor. Absolutely. And I, I'm, I can't um, help thinking about um, the, the students that um, have research projects that they need to conduct, especially on the undergraduate level, um, there's an increase in um, research components being integrated in, at undergraduate level. But if one looks at the, the time um, constraints in a research uh, module, at an undergraduate level. Um, and for those students to collect primary data, um, it is uh, a time consuming process as they would need to go through a research ethics application, um, which, which makes it really difficult where if they can focus on accessing existing data um, can at least assist with, with conducting research, um, um, interpreting, and also as, as the literature already uh, points out that the, that is also important that the data can be reused, it can be interpreted differently to what it was initially intended. So um, it is a challenge. Um, with regards to um, incentives at this stage for, for um, uh, the researchers to share their data. But I think that um, as librarians, 
we need to think of in a, innovative ways of um, promoting and um, advocating for a data sharing. And Moon, would you like to add something about sharing data uh, mm. motivation? Yes. Uh, well, I, I guess I already talked a little bit about the um, the unknowable opportunities in the data that you have now. Um, but uh, I guess also there's there there are some challenges. There's the challenges of uh, correctly describing in a consistent way the the licensing restrictions around data. Uh, the Creative Commons is a very useful tool for that, um, but uh, there's a, a mixed take up, I guess, in, in use of that. So that, as Lynn has mentioned during her presentation, uh, the interesting challenges of research is finding out what rights and accesses there are around reusing data that they've got. So I guess systematic policies um, in describing the metadata, the licensing rules around the metadata and so on are, are quite important in building effective sharing uh, processes. Uh, as our consistent approaches to descriptive metadata describing the data sets that you have. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there was another uh, question uh, going back to uh, citation, uh, data citation from Nina Lewin. Uh, she says data is generally badly cited and also the breakdown of how much data and use uh, was made of the data. Mm. So, <laughs> if you... I, I, think it, I think that that is uh, um, maybe just a comment that it is uh, in general being uh, badly uh, cited, but uh, um, it, it is something that has been um, a conversation for for some time and uh, i think that um more and more the the way the the, the platforms are set up and um, the metadata um that that um is is uh, generated um do to some extent um assist with with the with the, the problems of um, citing citing data, um, for example, within um, Fitchi, you have the the feature where um, it cites the data. Um, it provides you with a citation um, if you are going to use that that um, particular data set. So that, um, to an extent, assists um, um, researchers with with data reuse and and citing. Mm. Yeah. Um, and what, I see. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, Please. Sorry. No, no, it's fine. It, it, you know, I, I was uh, proposing to Edmund to uh, to share his view about this question of citability. Yes, I mean it. It comes to encouraging standards, doesn't it? In many ways. Uh, and it's a difficult evolving, evolving territory. Uh, I mean, Burns Lee was very keen uh, over a decade ago now, really, I guess, to promote the semantic web and the components of that are only really emerging now. So it's, it's, it's a long-term project uh, and it, it involves enlisting uh, the institutions uh, to be participating in consistent descriptive standards for data sets. And universities are, in many cases, the last uh, holdout of, of feudal hierarchies. So <laughs> they can be quite a difficult beast to, to move along for things like that. Uh, but the libraries have a big role in that context as well, uh, working with researchers because libraries have been uh, very consistent about effective standards, uh, as I mentioned during our presentation, and that's it's a big role in in research data sets that libraries have to play, uh, which is is uh, effective systematic descriptive metadata, semantic understanding of the data, uh, good linkages of data. That's that's really 
a challenge. And I think as the question implies, it's, it's uh, more of a challenge than a solution at the moment. Uh, there's somebody uh, asking uh, for speak. Uh, maybe I can. Uh, okay. Yes, please. Uh, you can speak. There's still a question, I know. <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, okay, maybe. <laughs> okay. Um, I do see, um, Francois, that we are five minutes uh, yes. over over the time. Um, I don't know. You, are we are we waiting for? Um, we have no more questions. As I see, who wanted to speak. Or okay. Okay. Um, I don't know who would like to make a conclusion. Maybe I, I can say a word. Um, uh, what I've seen uh, around these questions and uh, uh, this presentation is a crucial point of uh, a long-term view from the libraries uh, and also the collaborating role uh, that is a key to, uh, to uh, manage, uh, to build a, a good service. Um, supporting uh, data management. Uh, and uh, as you have shown, uh, many different tools uh, and some teams, uh, some uh, research uh, teams uh, have one tool and don't know other things that could be uh, good for their uh, data management. So uh, yeah, libraries uh, may have a, a really interesting role in this, uh, this collaboration, um, as I see. And if you want to. Thank, thank, thank you, Francois. From, from my side, um, I would also just like to uh, thank Francois for moderating and also uh, facilitating the webinar this, this, this morning. Well, on my side, it's uh, uh, afternoon now, and in Australia, it's in the evening. But uh, thank you very much for um, facilitating um, this webinar to. Edmund for the very interesting um, presentation on um, uh, the many, many uh, tools and technical considerations um, with regards to research data management. Um, I think that um, the session today um, leaves us with uh, quite uh, some food for thought in terms of um, also uh, where we are heading with uh, library uh, research data management services. Um, and um, it is, I, I, I think, um, um, it's left open for further research, for further uh, conversations um, and, 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 and networking um, in um, the future future um, role of um, academic libraries in particular with regards to research data management services. So I would like to also thank all the participants for um, joining our session today um, and for your questions. Um, this is the third um, um, webinar in our IT, IFLA IT section webinar series, and we do have a lineup of, of webinar topics. So please do look out for our, um, our next uh, lineup. Um, we will uh, certainly be keeping you posted so that we can continue the conversation. So thank you very much to everybody for your, um, your participation in our um, webinar today. Keep well and stay safe. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, everyone. It was a very interesting session. Goodbye. Thank, thank you, Edmund. Thanks. Thank you, Francois.